Two years ago, I attended a wedding with my family. This wedding was for a family friend, and she decided to have a Bangladeshi wedding, which meant a lot of vibrant colors and loud festive music and copious amounts of delicious food. So after a few hours, I mean, it was really fun, but I started to get a little bit tired. So I decided to sit down at a table nearby. At this table, there was a bowl sitting in the middle that was filled with these colorfully wrapped something, something that looked like candy. So I decided to take one, and I opened it. Inside, there was this brown and green concoction, and it smelled kind of minty. And after a while, I recognized it as something that I had seen throughout my childhood, as something called pan. So I decided to eat one, and I noticed that I felt a little more energized. Naturally, I ate six or seven more. <laughs> so a few minutes later, my dad comes by and sits down next to me, and he sees the colorful packages littered in front of me. And he says, be careful, Anika. Don't eat too many, or you might feel dizzy. Dizzy? Why would I feel dizzy? It's just pun. It's like a candy, right? My dad shook his head, and he said, well, sometimes when people eat too much pun, they start to feel this head rush. And I was definitely starting to feel that head rush. So I asked him again about if he knew why this happened, and he shrugged and he said he didn't know. So I decided to consult Wikipedia. It turns out that pawn has another name. It's called the areca nut or the beetle nut. And so when I was reading this Wikipedia page, I, for the first few sentences weren't anything super interesting until I came across this one. Consumption has many harmful effects on health, and is carcinogenic to humans. Various compounds present in the nut, including arecoline, the primary psychoactive ingredient, which is similar to nicotine, contribute to histologic changes in the oral mucosa. Consumption by hundreds of millions of people worldwide has been described as a neglected global public health emergency. What? When I first read this, I was shocked because Pawn was something that was so commonplace to me growing up. It's something that I had seen at festivities when I was a kid and had occasionally eaten. It's something that I knew that my relatives, my distant relatives, had stained red teeth and red lips from eating. When I showed my parents the Wikipedia entry, they had a similar reaction to mine. Well, actually, they started laughing because they didn't believe it and they thought it was a joke until they started to realize otherwise. As a scientist, I started to become curious about what it exactly is about the beetle nut that makes it cancerous. As an artist, I wanted to know why people all around the world were so compelled to eat the beetle nut. And as an activist, I wanted to know what was being done about it and why historically it had been such an underserved issue. So for the next two years, my part-time job became fervently researching the beetle nut. It turns out that it's actually approximately 10 to 20% of the world that consumes betel nut, and it's not just Bangladesh. It's also Guam, Cambodia, Philippines, even Hawaii. And it was just a little more than a decade ago that the World Health Organization found out that it was a class one carcinogen and declared it to be so. Furthermore, its consumption is linked to not only oral cancer, but a diversity of other cancers and chronic diseases. So if you're curious about what the beetle nut looks like, it's essentially this fruit, so it's a misnomer, and what people do is they either crush it or take it whole, and they mix it with a variety of spices or additives, wrap it in a leaf, and then they eat it. So there's this compound called arecoline, which actually lives inside the nut, and that's what causes cancer. And apparently, depending on what kinds of additives you mix with the beetle nut while you're preparing it, it can catalyze reactions that actually makes it more cancerous. So for example, in some countries, they add this white paste called slake lime, which is calcium hydroxide, which catalyzes this basic reaction to produce the more carcinogenic, carcinogenic form of arecoline. I started to read about why people ate it in different parts of the world, and I was surprised by the diversity of cultural practices surrounding the phenomenon. So in Bangladesh, as I mentioned, people eat it during festivities, but a lot of women will also eat it after puberty because it's seen as a hallmark of entering womanhood. In Nepal, a lot of the poor eat it to stave off hunger, and in Taiwan, male truck drivers eat it so that they can stay up during their hours of labor. In terms of the global politics, it's just as diverse. It's banned in the UAE and UK, but if you wanted to go and buy beetle nut right now, you could drive just 15 minutes to Miramar Cash and Carry and purchase some. 
What really caught my attention, though, was the role of betel nut in Chinese and Taiwanese culture, where it's called binlang. So Taiwan actually has the highest rate of oral cancer in the world because of their massive consumption of betel nut. It's one in five men, approximately, who consume the betel nut. And perhaps what's most interesting is that since 1996, the government has been trying to instill policies or educational programs and awareness programs to combat this issue. However, the rates of a precancerous condition have actually doubled since then. So why is that? Maybe it could be because betel nut has such a stronghold in Taiwan's economy. It's a cash crop, just like tobacco, and so that means it's profitable and very easy to grow. Furthermore, it's not just a health hazard, it's also an environmental hazard. It turns out that planting betel nut trees, which are like palm trees, in mountainous regions actually causes soil erosion. And so in 1999, when the 921 earthquake hit Taiwan, there were massive landslides in areas near these plantations, which ended, ended up killing many, many people who lived in these villages. Furthermore, there's a really, really interesting phenomenon in Taiwan specifically about binglang shi shi, which is betel nut beauty, as you can see an image here on this slide. So a betel nut beauty is a woman who usually comes from a more disadvantaged community, and oftentimes she'll go into working in the betel nut industry um, in, after high school. And these women sometimes dress promiscuously so that they can attract more attention from their customers, who are usually male. And so because of this association with sex work, almost, the consumption of betel nut is a very controversial issue in Taiwan. If you speak to northerners or people from more industrialized areas, it's almost seen as a frowned upon, a, frowned upon tradition to consume the betel nut. However, for those who live in the south or those who identify with national Taiwanese aboriginal culture, it's something that could even be a source of pride. In contrast, I want to talk about Xiangtan, China. So one would think that cancer would be a much bigger issue because it's approximately 80% of the residents who consume the betel nut. And it's not just men, it's also women and children, and they start consuming betel nut at a very young age. Furthermore, it's interesting because they consume it almost because it's a social lubricant or a breath freshener, so for completely different reasons. What really caught my interest was this discrepancy. The fact that so many more people in Xiangtan, China, consume the betel nut, yet they have one of the lowest rates of oral cancer in the world in regards to countries that consume betel nut. So I started to look more into the issue, and I found out that apparently the pr they prepare it a certain way in Xiangtan where they use a dried version of it, and they have some other unique additives that are localized to that region. And so I started wondering, maybe it's because they prepare it in a different way, and that's what makes it less cancerous. So obviously at this point, I had become very, very invested in this issue, and I started to wonder, what can I do about it? What can I, a first-generation American with a weirdly personal connection to this issue halfway across the world and a rudimentary capacity for speaking Chinese, do about it? Something that I want to focus on today is the universal nature of this question. What can we do about the injustices that we hear about or read about on the internet that are occurring halfway across the world? What is our role in forming a more just society? How, what is our role in doing that and how do we go about it? So unfortunately, I'm only 22 and I don't really have the answer to this question yet. However, it's something that I've been asking myself a lot recently, and I just wanted to take a few steps back and share some of my ideas about how we, as citizens of the 21st century, might go about a new form of change making. So for me personally, two key barriers to driving change in society are jargon and dogmas, or the status quo, about knowledge. So by jargon, I mean the kinds of terms or language that people use in different fields or different academic disciplines or jobs to describe their work. However, as someone who has worked in different disciplines, something that's very sad to me is the fact that jargon can serve to be an artificial barrier between not only people in different fields who are trying to solve the same issue, but also between people who have degrees and maybe those who have never had the opportunity to attain those degrees or further educational training. Furthermore, what I mean when I say dogmas about knowledge, I mean 
I believe that sometimes society has this notion that the only people who are qualified to create knowledge or propose solutions are those who have degrees or who are professors, scientists, policymakers, doctors, you name it. But what about the rest of the world? What about the people who live through these issues? Couldn't one argue that because they live through them, they have a deeper cultural knowledge and experiential knowledge of these issues that someone sitting in an office hundreds of miles away can never have? And so another question that I've been asking myself a lot recently is, how do we democratize who has the power to imagine these solutions to pressing global issues? How do we make invisible kinds of knowledge more visible? Meaning, how do we harness the power of technical, law, technical knowledge that a scientist might have with the cultural knowledge that someone living in that region might have or the experiential knowledge? And something that I've started to explore throughout my four years here at UCSD is the role of visual communication, specifically visual arts or documentary filmmaking um, that's community engaged as a tool for breaking down these artificial barriers between the people who oftentimes have the power to create change and those who live through these issues. So for me, I've really been experimenting with this idea of using multimedia film to go and talk to these populations that live through these problems so that we can not only have a better understanding of how these problems tangibly affect people's lives, but to do so in a very humanizing way that you know, a policy report or data cannot capture. And so what if you could take that visual data, that film, and then show it to the right person, show it to the right policymaker or scientist who might have an idea about how to use contemporary tools to address that issue. Another aspect of visual communication that I've been exploring is pairing it with structural change. So what I mean by that is not just creating a documentary film for the sake of raising public global awareness about some issue, but doing so in a targeted way. For example, how can we show that to those relevant policymakers? Or how can we start working to change the structural or factual aspects of that problem, whether it's through medical practice, economic policy, or law? So I just wanted to quickly highlight um, two examples of how I've done this in the past. So last summer, I was working at the US-Mexico border, and I heard about this issue of border-generated air pollution and its impact on the respiratory health of local communities. It's a really difficult issue because it's very invisible. Pollution is something, air pollution is something you can't see, and asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, they're both very long-term diseases, and they're not something that is very, very apparent in less than a year. So what I decided to do is, through the representational approach, I decided to create a documentary film where I interviewed people who lived at the border about their narratives of how this issue impacted their lives. And then I decided to take that film and show it to members of the California EPA and the Border Commission on Environmental Health. And I've been working with them to see how we can translate this into policy changes, or at least open a dialogue between the people who live there and the people who are supposed to be in charge of making change. And so that film is actually going to be on exhibit at the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego in the next few weeks. Another project uh, that I've been working on is my thesis here at UCSD. And so it's about urinary tract infection in women. So historically, the the treatment for urinary tract infection in women has been very outdated. And so what I started to do is I'm working with some of the doctors here on campus and a leading expert in the urinary microbiome um, to basically further research this issue and try to uncover more knowledge and revise practices for UTI treatment. At the same time, I want to work on the representational side, so I've been interviewing women who have been experiencing UTI about their notions of UTI stigma so that I can show these videos to doctors and scientists so that when they go about their practice, they're aware not just of the way that urinary tract infection impacts the bodies of these women, but also their mental health. So to try to apply this emerging theory that I've been developing in my mind to the issue of betel nut consumption, I wanted to think about finding a way to make betel nut consumption more culturally compatible. 
And so again, I wanted to use this perspective of using visual communication as a tool that can bridge the community, so people who consume BeetleNet with the policymakers in Taipei and some of the technical experts who are working on the medicinal side of it. So I'm really excited to share that what I'll be doing is, in September, I'll be leaving to Taiwan, and I'll be working with the Taiwanese Ministry of Health and, Health and Welfare to first understand some of the um, policy implications of beetle net consumption and regulation. Then I'll be traveling through Taiwan and China to basically create a documentary film with the consumers in both countries so that I can understand their perspectives and their cultural reasons for preparing beetle nut however way they prepare it. And then I'll take samples from both countries and run a variety of scientific experiments on them to try to validate my idea about, you know, is it really true that maybe in Shangtan they create, they, they prepare the beetle nut in a way that makes it less cancerous. And then my hope is to go back to the government and then show this film that I made with the consumers to the policymakers to hopefully bridge the gap and start opening a dialogue between these populations that historically have not interfaced. And so I get this question a lot, you know, how did you end up pulling off this project that's halfway across the world? So my answer is the internet and a lot of luck. Just a week after I read about the interesting case of Xiangtan in China, I walked into my biochem class, and it turns out that my professor was a plant biochemist who grew up in that, in that town. And so he got, me in touch to, uh, he got me in touch with people in China. At the same time, um, I was at a separate conference, and I was just talking to someone I had just met about my random fascination with betel nut. And it turns out that he knew a few scientists in Taiwan. And so I forwarded my proposal, and through a fifth degree connection, um, I got in touch with the vice president of Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> or rather, I got an email from him and his research team. So apparently, they had been trying to find new ways to approach this issue of betel nut consumption, and they really liked my idea of using this multidisciplinary approach. Um, and so I'm. Again, really, really excited to share that I'll be moving to Taiwan in September for a year to undertake this project. And so here's a small baby betel nut mixture that I've made based upon what I bought just 20 minutes from here at a grocery store. So if there's one thing that I hope you take away from listening to this story, it's that you don't have to be an expert to make change. I mean, I'm 22, and I just have probably way too much curiosity that's good for me, and opposable thumbs for internet access. And that's what really got me to undertaking all the projects that I've, under that I've undertook. It's been a lot of cold emailing people who, knew who know more about border pollution or betel nut or UTI stigma, and then working with that and seeing how far I can go. And so to, to re return finally to the, to the title of this talk, I think today we live in a society where we're inundated so much with media and so many things are going on and it's very easy to be a passive consumer. However, I believe that we also live in a really unique time where there is this open culture of access to knowledge through you know, Wikipedia or the internet or cold emailing people. And I think that if anything, we are more situated, more well situated than ever before to create change. So to link back to the theme for this event, I hope that you go on to burst not only your own bubble, but society's bubble about what everyone thinks that the person who is a change maker looks like. Thank you.